Hello, it's Lion here with Hobbies Man. Once again, today we're going to be doing another novel review. We're going to be looking at Louis L'Amour's Flint, uh, which is a standalone novel by uh, this, you know, author that was basically um, the biggest and best author for Western novels, uh, Louis L'Amour. He died in 1988, so about 40 years ago, and uh, he published over 122 novels. He did some nonfiction as well, some poems, some short stories, you know, everything that you can think of, this guy did it. And most of the stuff that he wrote, wrote, uh, I think mostly actually all of it, was historical fiction in some way, and most of it was in the Western genre. So uh, this is published by Bantham. The demographic is adult, the genre is Western, and it does not really have an adaptation, I, I don't think, um, but it would be a pretty cool movie or a short single season TV show. I think it'd be really interesting and pretty enjoyable. And um, right off the bat, I would give this a five out of five. Um, so I decided to read this because one, I've never read a Western before. Two, I found it at Walmart for like $7 um, instead of, uh, actually no, I think if, if the uh, price tag here is $8, I think I probably found this for like five or six. And because one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, Michael K. Vaughn, was actually doing this event called June on the Range where he read a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of Western stuff. And a lot of people also did it, and a lot of them happened to pick Flint to read, and so all of the stars aligned so that I could read Flint as well. I finished it just a few days ago, right before the end of the of the month here, and I really, really like this. I, I think Louis L'Amour is going to be an author I'm going to continue to check out. And I'll probably end up just picking up whatever Louis L'Amour novel they have at Walmart at any given time, although I could easily go down to my half price books and get any of the thousands of Louis L'Amour novels that they have there or any of the hundreds, not thousands, honestly. The, the, the half rice books is not that big. But I think I need to do a little bit more research about a Louis L'Amour series and which ones I'm, I'm most interested in, right? But um, yeah, I think I found another author on the same level as Edgar Rice Burroughs in terms of like my desire to read all their stuff, right? So um, yeah, the premise of this is that there's this guy, his name is James Kettleman. He is someone that originated from the West, moved to the East, became a tycoon, in the, the, the era that he lived in. Um, and he apparently has some illness, cancer, I think is what we're told uh, near the end of the novel. And so being a lonely, solitary man, even though he's married and he has a wife that uh, sucks a lot, actually, she's a horrible person. Um, and he's very successful. He wants to go and die alone like he was for most of his life. And so he decides to go back East he closes his accounts, he does all of this stuff, he removes uh, all of the money so that his wife can't get to it, um, so that he can have a little nest egg to use in the West. And he moves to, to the West, he moves to a place, he takes on the name Flint, which is the name of the only person that ever seemed to care about him, uh, which was this, uh, this killing man. Uh, and he goes back, and when he gets there, he accidentally ends up stumbling across a bunch of stuff and he needs to become the man he used to be when he was part of the West in order to um, to survive and maybe live out the last few days that he has in comfort and with a good woman. And so it's a very good story. It's very enjoyable. It's very cool. It takes a lot of effort to tell you who Flint is, who tell you who Jim is, uh, James. Um, and actually sometimes you might even consider it boring in the sense that why am I being told all this stuff? because it, it truly doesn't matter, but also it matters in the sense that later when it comes up and you learn about this character, this other character or this situation, it makes all of the previous setup that you kind of felt bored by while you're reading it make sense and it's really, really good. I really like the way that this is written. There's only a few moments where I'm like, okay, this doesn't really make sense. I don't understand what exactly is being told to me right now. And I don't know if that's because the language is used weirdly, as in it's not written in the way that it would be today, or because the way that he writes uh, allows for uh, the reader to have to think a little bit more, which is something I'm not used to since most modern uh, writers don't uh, do that. Uh, most writers tell you exactly what's happening at all times. Um, or, you know, it might be some other thing where the language, as in the diction, uh, is, is awkward. Um, and it's just kind of how it is. It's not really a problem. It's very few and far between that that happens, but it does happen some, sometimes here and there. And so if you're someone like me, 20-something 20, 20 year old, 
um, that mostly reads manga and comic books, you might find yourself having a little bit of a difficult time here with this. Um, but, you know, your mileage may vary. I only had like a struggle here and there, like maybe two, two or three times in this book. And I could just continue reading and it didn't really matter that I didn't understand exactly what was going on because eventually, it, you know, it made sense. So the plot line for this uh, is that we get an introduction. We get James Kettleman on a train. Uh, he meets this woman called Nancy Kerrigan. And the, the thing is that you don't know what age Nancy Kerrigan is because the way they're talking about her initially makes it seem like she's like early 20s. And then sometimes it looks like she's 16 years old. And then other times it's like she's 25 and you just never know. I would honestly say that she's probably in her 18 to 22 year age range where Kettleman is 40. Um, but the connection that he and Nancy make just with eye contact is a driving force across the rest of the novel. And so you should pay attention to that aspect there when it gets uh, you know brought up. Then James Kettleman actually gets off the train before it gets anywhere. Uh, and you know, someone tells them, you know, it's still far away uh, way from, you know, from here to the next station. Are you sure you want to get off here? And he says, yeah, it's fine. Then we get his backstory. He was an orphan. He was left uh, somewhere. Eventually, this guy called Flint picks him up. He puts him in a school. And then Flint picks him up and takes him with him across uh, across the West and teaches him things. The, the thing is that eventually Flint, um, Flint has a job that's dangerous. He is a hunting man. He Basically, it's hired to kill people. And so eventually this comes back to bite him. And so people uh, gather together at this place called The Crossing, which I think is in Kansas. They take him, they hold him down, and they shoot him down. And so a bunch of people uh, are now, you know, have finally beaten Flint. And uh, Jim, or James, finds out about this, gets really angry because this is the only person that he had in his life, and goes and shoots down all of these people kills most of them except one guy called Pete Gaddis, uh, which we learn later on in the story. And then the only thing he says is that that guy was my friend. And then he leaves, they disappear, and then eventually James moves on to the east where he becomes this tycoon. And so we're back to where we uh, were at the beginning of the novel. Um, and uh, eventually Jim gets off the train and he goes on to this hideout, which he knew uh, from descriptions that Flint had told him, but he'd never actually been there himself. He kind of has to trek quite a bit, and so he ends up having having to take a nap twice, I think, uh, across this, this travel. The first time he's uh, uh, encountered by this guy, guy called Nukent, who is another uh, big person in this area of the world, who he tells off, he's like, you know, go away, you're a squatter, uh, move, move, move out of here, I, I don't really have anything to do with you, I'm just passing by. And then eventually he also meets Pete Gaddis, who he actually quite likes, um, and Gaddis actually kind of likes him too. However, this becomes an issue later, right? Eventually, um, you know, Flint or Jim James manages to go into the hideout. He takes on the personality of Jim Flint, uh, Jim being his name and Flint being the name of his uh, his father figure, his friend, um, and then. Uh, we kind of move over to a different part of the story where Nancy has to deal with the issue of land ownership in this West uh, kind of area because, yes, technically her father and her uncle made this ranch and they've had this cattle grazing situation here going on for a long time, but they don't have a physical piece of paper that says they own this land. Even though they've bought it, they've, you know, treasured it, they've used it for all of these things. And so she sends out all of her cow hands and all of her writers, all of the important people that she can trust, sends them to different places to uh, put down information to make sure that they do have a land right for this place so that when uh, other people come in uh, and they kind of plea to the to the government to uh, prefer them over the people that were already here, they don't do that, right? Because um, the laws of land ownership in the West are very nebulous and they're always been nebulous, but at this point, they're actually favoring people that are recently moving in instead of the people that used to be there. And so she, she, she wants this to not be an issue, right? However, it is going to be an issue because there's this guy called Port Baldwin uh, who moves in in order to take advantage of that. And he starts making a lot of moves that get on a lot of people's nerves. He goes after Nugent, he goes after Nancy, and Flint actually ends up kind of getting embroiled in this situation by accident, gets pulled in, and now Flint has to um, use all of his cunning and, and, and ability and stuff like that in order to get um, out of it. 
and he joins in with Nancy. They fight Baldwin a few times, and then eventually Flint gets pushed out because Pete Gaddis realizes, hey, this guy is the guy that shot me as a kid, and he's probably here to do the job, to finish the job, right? But it turns out that that's not really the case. Um, however, they can't really think about that in the moment. It's kind of a spur of the moment kind of situation where they kind of push Flint away and shit happens and that's just kind of how it goes. And so Flint settles down. He's like, okay, I shouldn't have gotten involved anyways. I don't really need those people. I'm here alone. That's what I plan to do. And I'm gonna hear, I, I, I'm here to die alone, right? And so he does that. And then eventually he goes to the doctor and the doctor's like, dude, you're, you don't have cancer. You're not gonna die. You just have ulcers. You only needed to rest, not be that stressed, uh, which compared to how he lived in the East, he's not that stressed here, even though he's getting shot and, and you know pommeled uh, left and right. And you just needed to eat good food. And he's been doing all of that. He's been living it up. And so he's actually kind of on the up and up. He's kind of getting better. And so um, he's like, okay, well, what the fuck do I do now? I was ready to not die. Uh, I was ready to die. Now that I don't have to die, what am I going to do? And so he decides that he wants to 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 end the issue. He wants to be with Nancy. And uh, this all kind of gets turned down again because uh, Lottie shows up. And Lottie is his wife who initially was uh, conspiring with Baldwin all the way back in the east in New York to try to kill um, Kettleman so that she could take all of his money. He knew this and that's why he didn't leave her any money at the beginning. And so um, now we have this issue, Nancy and Lottie actually, you know, throw some words around and eventually shit happens, all of this stuff, uh, you know, ends up kind of boiling in, in, in this pot and then exploding. And eventually, you know, we get the fight that we need to. Uh, Flint beats this guy called Buck Dunn, who is actually an assassin uh, that works for Baldwin. Uh, Baldwin and Flint fight and Flint actually beats him in a boxing match. And he beats him physically, and so Baldwin knows, okay, I'm never gonna win against this guy. I'm gonna leave. He divorces Lottie, and he gets with Nancy at the end. He asks her, hey, Flint is a tough name, but I want you to share it with me. And she's like, if that's the name you want, that's the name I'll keep as well. And it was really, really good. I love this novel. It was really, really enjoyable. I liked it a lot. It was very atmospheric. It felt so real. It was so uh, good. It was just very, well, very, very well written. In terms of characters, we have Flint, uh, both of them. Uh, Flint, the original, and James Kettleman Flint, who goes by Jim Flint. Nancy Kerrigan, Lottie, Port Baldwin, Pete Gaddis, uh, Buck Dunn, and a few other characters that are really not that important, but that are kind of just set dressing. They make you feel more invested because you know their names. And in terms of world building, we really have none because there really is no world building to do. This is a historical setting. And so everything that happens here is setting building, not world building. Uh, and it's very, very good. In terms of artwork and stuff like that, it doesn't have any, uh, like that is part of the novel, but at the end of this, after it tells you about, you know, uh, his life and Louis L'Amour's kind of stuff, you kind of get these little images back here that are like covers or stuff like that from, you know, the magazines this was published in and from some other stuff here and there that I think were kind of cool. Um, they don't really have anything to do with this book specifically though so that's why they're in the back they're not part of the book um and then you know we don't have anything else here um but this was a good, really really good i quite liked it so um yeah ratings was a five out of five it was so so good it was really really enjoyable and for me the best part was actually jim's character i quite like him a lot the way he's written the way he's described it makes me feel like i'm watching john carter or or um of Tarzan, but with a little bit more kind of uh, honest humanity to them. And then we, I feel like a little bit like we're watching James Bond, but it, it's just really cool. Cause it's like, if, if Tarzan was a gunslinger, he'd be Flint. And I, I really like that. I think that's really, really cool. It just works really, really nicely for me. I also like this kind of like world weary, but also kind of willingness to engage that this guy has because it's, it's, it's kind of weird, right? It's, it's a very interesting kind of look at, at, at a person because most people that I know in, in, you know, in my life are either I'm open to the world or I'm com completely closed off to it and I kind of hate everything, right? And we usually get to see a lot of characters like that because that's kind of a grim dark approach to things that American seems to really like. But the fact that Flint is this closed off kind of dark man, but also 
is completely willing to open himself up if the opportunity presents itself. And and you always mention this thing about the small kindnesses that uh, Flint allows himself. Even though he doesn't really want praise, he, he has this like niceness to him that I really really like I really like this character a lot it's very very good and uh, I just like that he, he he doesn't back down he's a really really cool character so there you go that's uh, that's it for Flint I hope you guys enjoyed let me know what you thought let me know if you've read any western novels and if you've read this one specifically let me know what you thought about it so yeah thank you guys very much for watching and see you guys later